you know, it's a lot to cover in a short period of time, so I'll kind of like scatter through things. I was 18 years old and a sophomore at Michigan State, sitting in the student union. I ran track and I was sitting around a bunch of jocks. Someone bought me a newspaper and I read on the inside page about four students sitting in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I said, wow. It sort of struck a deep chord inside of me. Michigan State was in East Lansing. East Lansing was basically a segregated town. The campus was desegregated. There were more Nigerian students at Michigan State than African Americans because Michigan State University had a partnership with the University of Nigeria, with, with the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Um, it was a center of the Peace Corps linguistics languages for training, and no blacks could own property in East Lansing. The president of Michigan State was a guy named Dr. John Hanna, who at the time was also chairman of the United States Civil Rights Commission, appointed by Eisenhower in 1957 under the Civil Rights Act of 57. So there's this kind of the setting. Um, so I read this article about these students, and I talked to a couple of us. We got to go there. We got to be supported. This is important. This is unique. This is great. So we hitchhike, which is the days when you can hitchhike, to Washington D.C. and grab the bus from there to Greensboro, because you could not hitchhike in Virginia without getting killed back in that time. Still can't in some ways. But um, we participated with the students down there on their demonstrations. They told us to go back to campus and form support groups for what they were doing by picketing the local five and dime stores, which was Woolworths at the time, um, which I did. And I suddenly got myself caught up. Now, I think I was born in a generation that had a historical per imperative. My dad was a World War II vet. He came home. I was a child of an army person like children all over the world. My parents were still alive. A lot of the world's children had no parents or only one parent. Their father or mother got killed on the front lines. Their father or mother got killed in a factory making airplanes or guns or what have you. So that was a culture to which I evolved from. And this was a culture that I was beginning to evolve into. So we organized demonstrations at Michigan State. We picketed the president's house, which was on campus, you know, uh, at the time when presidents could still live on campus. Mm -hmm. And um, he called me out because I was a communist and outside agitator and all the things that you know, presidents do when they don't like what you're saying. And I said, well, you're the chairman of the Civil Rights Commission. You should do something about the segregated properties and homes in East Lansing, Michigan. But you know, he didn't like me and so forth. But in the meantime, I got a letter from a group of people who I didn't know. Now, between February 1st, 1960 and April, Easter weekend, over 100,000 young people in the South from the, from the Potomac River to the Rio Grande started demonstrating. This all happened in a matter of time, just without word, you know, cell phones, party communications lines, you know, newspapers that didn't cover what they were doing. This was all in a, a spark of word of mouth by campus to campus to campus to campus. And so a lady, one of the greatest ladies in American history named Ella Baker, convened this group of students, their representatives, at her co college, she graduated from in 1927, Shaw College, now Shaw, now Shaw University, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And from this meeting evolved the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And in October of that year, I went to one of their meetings in Atlanta as a young student. And I was, in, I mean, I was starstruck, all these great heroes around here, and I'm just sitting on campus not doing anything relevant. So I agreed to organize a book drive from Michigan State to Miles College in Birmingham, or I think it's in Bessemer, outside of Birmingham, uh, books where they were trying to get their accreditation. And so that was an adventure in of itself. Got busted leaving the school with the truck, you know, ended up in jail, got bailed out by SNCC, went to Atlanta, got fed, shipped back to Michigan State. That following spring, I got a letter from SNCC saying that they were pushing people off the plantations in Mississippi due to the political politics of organizing for the vote. So a group of us organized a food drive down to Clarksdale, Mississippi. We collected food at Michigan State's campus and the University of Michigan's campus. 
had a stop over in Louisville where Ann Braden and Carl and the, the Skep people sort of took care of us. I, th I hope you know about Ann and Carl Braden. They're very important people to our history. Um, and went on to Clarksdale, Mississippi. We got in the later, about 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd never been to Mississippi before, you know, so it was, I didn't think anything of this, you know, just delivering food. So we didn't know where to go. So we were delivering this food to the Clark, the 4th Street drugstore, Dr. Aaron Henry, who had Mississippi NAACP. And so we parked in front of his store and went to sleep. About an hour later, a policeman banged on our window, asked us what we were doing there. We said we were waiting for Dr. Henry's doctors or pharmacists to, to open up, and they said, get out of the truck. So I got out of the truck. This guy started to, you know, basically verbally abuse me. And, you know, I'm from New York. My dad was a cop. I was about ready to take him on. Ben, who was an ex-football player, grabbed me and said, no, 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 you can't do anything. I said, this guy's talking trash. You can't have this. Anyway, the long and short of that is we got thrown in jail. Clarksdale City Jail. We were there for three days. We were never charged. And three days later, they moved us to Coma County Jail. And this was really sort of crazy. No one knew where we were. Now, the Coma County Jail is like a dormer with, you know, double bunk beds running up and down the aisles on the second floor with toilets every four bunk beds around. And it was a very strange experience. <laughs> so I discovered that they collected money from the parking meters in the black prisoners, because this is, this is a segregated jail, county jail. So I talked one of these guys into dropping a note off at Doc Henry's store, because he collected the meter right in front of it. I wrote on some toilet paper, gave it to him. He said, you're going to owe me big time. I said, I got you covered, brother. So he dropped the note off in the store. And that afternoon, I heard Doc Henry's voice outside, demanding to know where Ben Taylor, my, my partner, and I were. And they, they mumbled and so forth and so on. And there we were, still in jail. Well, I got, finally, Carsey Hall, who was one of two black lawyers, qualified in Mississippi to practice law, came to see me and Ben. And he said, the constant M Baker Motley from the NAACP in New York, the, urban, the uh, Legal Defense Fund, was coming down to Clarksdale to, to file a writ of habeas corpus get us out of jail. I said, well, what were we charged with? He said, you're charged with transporting drugs across state lines. I said, what drugs? We only bought food and clothing. He said, well, you had aspirins in the truck. And you know, one thing led to another. Our bomb was $15,000 a piece. SNCC's budget at that time was $14,000, so we were 30000 We said, oh, I think we're going to be here a while. And I was beginning to wonder what my father was thinking, because he didn't know I was not on campus taking courses like I should be. So uh, you know, all of this is going through your head. And finally, we get out. They posted uh, some farmer put up the, his property for us to get out. We went back to Louisville, you know, um, and then back to campus. And my dad called me, and he said, uh, you were in school last week. I said, what do you mean, Dad? He said, I got it posted on the bulletin board in the police house where I work that you were in Mississippi in jail. What are you doing? So we had one of those father-son kind of talks, you know. Um, now, I came from a family that was old-fashioned. You know, my dad told me to do something. I just did it. My mother told me to do something. I just do it. You know, so there was this generational change where I said yes, but I did something different. So while they thought I was in college, I simply was out organizing for SNCC. One thing led to another. I ended up in the South the following fall. Uh, I was a part of the direct action arm of SNCC, which means that I was a body to go to jail, as opposed to people working on voter registration who were also bodies to go to jail. We went to jail for constitutional issues that were far from a, far more fundamental than getting a hamburger at a, a store that I wouldn't eat at anyway. Because they, you know, when you desegregated these stores, you never went back to them because they were spitting your food and things like that in the kitchen. You never know what's going on. Um, the long and the short is that SNCC became, in, in the fall of 1961, the fall of 1960, 12 people from SNCC dropped out of college. Now, you know, these are people who are first-generation college students. Their parents sweated and bled blood to get them into college. And here they were going to drop out of college for this cause. So it was a serious business with us. And I then joined that group the following spring, you know, um, doing direct action in 
Atlanta, Birmingham, Selma, Jackson, Holly Springs, Mississippi, Louisville, Kentucky. We were like stormtroopers. <coughs> well, in 63, I joined the voter registration staff of SNCC, uh, and I went to Mississippi to do voter registration. Now, I could tell you a lot of horror stories. You know, I think you probably know them all. Um, or if you don't, there were a lot of horror stories. Um, but SNCC was an organization that believed in organizing from, from the bottom up. Dr. King, who is a hero of all of, us, all of us in SNCC, although we don't always agree with him, was a mobilizer where he came, thousands of people gathered, he spoke, they left, they dispersed. We were on the grassroots where we came, it took us. I organized a mass meeting in Isquina County, Mississippi, and seven people showed up. And I was a hero. Seven people, no one in the stick believed it could seven people to a meeting. You know, six months later, there were 100 people at that meeting. Five years later, Unita Blackwell became mayor of Myersville, the county seat of Issaquina County. So that's the struggle of getting voting done in Mississippi. It's hard, it's tedious, it was painful, it was dangerous. But it was about people speaking for themselves, not us speaking. SNCC people didn't want to be leaders. They wanted to be the organizers. And, um, and when in SNCC there was always this, this tug in the war of where we organizing for ourselves, where we organize for people. If you organize for people, you do what people want you to do. Sam Block, a SNCC organizer in Greenwood, Mississippi, um, found out that the, the city fathers were going to build a sidewalk in one of the neighbors of the black community. And Sam, at a, a meeting, said, you know what, if we go out and demonstrate, we'll get sidewalks out here. And they went out and demonstrated, and they got sidewalks. And from there on, that movement grew, because Sam delivered sidewalks to them. And they thought that was through their voices, their strengths. And that was organized. That's, that's what organizing was about. It was about the tedium of putting it together. So there was some romance in SNCC. You know, I organized Julian Bond's campaign in 1965 for the Georgia House. It was interesting. I, Judy Richardson, and Charlie Cobb went to Holly Springs, where SNCC was having its executive committee meeting, to get approval to organize Julian Bond's campaign. And SNCC, although for the rights to vote, didn't think that they were going to run for public office. You know, that was not a SNCC thing. And it was this big, huge argument about Julian running for office. But we said, no, this, this is, our office is in this district. Morehouse and Spelman College is in this district. You know, we live in these, this, district, this, this district. So they finally approved. Foreman gave us a $100 check. We went back to Atlanta. A lot of money, $100 back then. And the lady who owned a beauty shop on Hunter Street, which is now, I think, called Abernathy Avenue or something, gave us the front window. We put a table in there, a sign, and went out to organize the neighborhood. Now, Julian had four children, and his wife didn't want him to run for office. So she would leave the house early in the morning, and Julian was stuck with the children. So Charlie Cobb and I was walking the street saying, hi, I'm Julian Bond, you know? <laughs> and I would like you to know. And now, Julian's father was, is, is a famous educator, a world-famous educator. And they said, oh, I know your father. You're such a nice guy. And I said, please, I just want, want your vote, and, you know, representing this district. And Julian won. With Charlie Cobb and I. <laughs> so there were three Julians out there, you know, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but there were a lot of issues in SNCC that uh, SNCC was not only a civil rights organization, it was a human rights organization. We had relationships with Africa. We had relationships with... with Jim Foreman was a great guy. I mean, Jim Foreman would, he was my mentor. Ella Baker was my hero. And between the two of them, you know, I grew up, uh, developed a, a, a sense of perspective of life. I was a stupid kid when I went into SNCC. I didn't know what I was doing. I was too crazy. I would never have done it if I had common sense, you know. Um, but, you know, you, had, you learned, I didn't know I was scared until I got beat up. Then I got scared. You know, and then suddenly you, you develop the strength and the tenacity with the community around you to stand together and bond together. And I have today, all of my best friends are from SNCC. You know, uh, we, we talk to each other, we work with each other. You know, we have a, a board, a SNCC board, the SNCC Legacy Project Board that deals with the archives of SNCC. So we're here and there. And I know that the mouse, I've talked more than I should. So I'll wait for questions and come back.